And welcome to our church family. Hopefully everybody has set their New Year resolutions. Uh, last year, my New Year resolution was to lose 20 pounds, and so this year I only have 25 to go. So that's good news. But, uh, you know, New Year resolutions are always like a mountain that you have to climb. Sometimes you go up, and then you have to climb back down, and it's this back and forth. But finally, you can reach your goal, and the goal is to stay there. But when it comes to climbing, you cannot convince me to climb anything. I have this deeply biological fear of heights. And by biological, I mean when I get up high, my biology takes over my mind, and I, like, will almost pass out. Angel and I, when we were in a mall, it was three stories high. And why do malls do this? They make the walls glass, as if that's going to help anything at all. If you run into it, it's glass. I mean, you're going to fall through it. And then you get to see all the way down as you plummet to your death. Like, I'm like going to start a protest against glass walls in malls, but it's three stories high. And I'm literally walking, and I'm not telling Angel this because... I'm a man, but now she knows. But I'm walking with my hand alongside of the wall so I can stay away from the glass shelf because I'm feeling dizzy, I'm feeling sick. I do not like to climb stuff at all. You put me up high, this is about as high as I go, okay? When I have to climb on ladders, I only do it because it's absolutely necessary. I hate climbing stuff. And what's weird is I've never fallen. I really don't know where my fear of heights actually has come from. I've never fallen from anything that's, that's high up. I've never broken any bones after falling down. But even like watching like YouTube videos of those crazy people that do parkour and stuff, where they literally go up to super high buildings and they jump around and they jump off the side of the buildings and do pull-ups and they do back flips and front flips. And I'm like, what is wrong with these people? I mean, there's something seriously wrong with you. And they have no straps at all on their entire body. It's crazy to me. But nevertheless, they do it. That's the mountain, I guess, if you want to call it, that they want to climb. It's what gives them a rush. It's what they love. I simply, I don't get it. But here's what I know for sure. Despite having absolute zero climbing experience, I know this. If you are going to climb a mountain, you've got to train. You've got to have the right mindset. You've got to have the right attitude. And actually, if you're going to climb a mountain, once you get up so high, You've got to actually let the environment take over your body, and your body's got to adjust and acclimate to the environment around you. And if you fail to train, and if you fail to have the right mindset with the right attitude, and if you fail to let yourself adjust to the new normal, you'll fail to climb. And that's the same way it is in life. That's the same way it is with our challenges that we want to overcome, or maybe we want to deal with our challenges differently this year. If we fail to train ourselves, it's not going to be easy. If we fail to have the right attitude with the right mindset, if we fail to let ourselves adjust to the new normal, whatever that new normal is, we'll fail to climb. Now, for some of us, our mountain this year, the hill that we're going to climb, is bodily control. We want to exercise. We want to diet. We want to eat better. Some of us, we have a mountain of spiritual growth. We really haven't grown much spiritually before, and so we want a better relationship with God. We want a better understanding of His Word. We want to grow spiritually. For some of us, that mountain is relational growth, whether it be marriage or family or friends, while others, it's economic growth. We want to have a better job. We want to do better at our job. We want to save. We want to retire. Whatever it is, we all have our own mountain that we're going to climb this year. And as a Christian, our mountain, it's going to take training. It's not going to be easy. And we have to have the right mindset with the right attitude. And you know what's really cool is there's a church, it's actually an epistle is written to it, which is what we're going to study this morning in Philippians. It's the city of Philippi. Philippi was in this region of Macedonia, which was formerly um, a Greek province. In fact, Philippi was named after Philip the Great, one of the greatest leaders in the Greek empire. Well, the Romans took it over. And when they took over the region of Macedonia, they also took over the the city known as Philippi. And Philippi was one of the cities that the Apostle Paul planted a church at on his second missionary journey. There were hardly any Jews there. There were only a few Jews. There was no synagogue in Philippi. You had to have at least 10 men in order to have a synagogue. And so there was a low Jewish population, a high Greek and Roman population. And without that entire city was a complete religious diversity. They had cults. They had religions, and a lot of them were very barbaric. They had animal worship, human sacrifice, orgiastic worship, where they would go in and they would worship the sex goddess with orgies and uh, sleeping with prostitutes. I mean, we're talking about a very messy, very religiously diverse city. 
And yet Paul goes there to Philippi, and he preaches the gospel, and they start to win converts, and they build a church, and the church at Philippi becomes one of the greatest churches known, not just in the New Testament, but really throughout all of ages. They became like the the hallmark. They became the measuring bar for what a church on fire for Jesus looked like, and yet it was in this really like chaotic situation, an imperfect circumstance. One of the most unique aspects of Philippi is they had this huge mountain-like structure. It was the 750-foot wall. As soon as you entered the city, you were immediately confronted with this giant cliff that you could climb, and they had actually engraved religious symbols across that wall. And so it was like this. Every single person that entered the city of Philippi were immediately confronted with religious diversity, with different opinions and different ideas. And you know, that's kind of like a lot about America, is it not? I mean, there are a lot of different religious diversity, a lot of different uh, economical diversity. We're one of the most diverse nations in the entire world. There's a plethora of ideas and principles and values, and we as Christians have to find our way to navigate our hill, to climb our mountain throughout this entirely different, imperfect format. And so that's what we're going to take a look at. You know, when Paul, he actually began his missionary work in Philippi, he preached the gospel so strongly, they actually drug him before the magistrate, and they charged him with this. It says this in Acts uh, Acts 16.21. It says, they, speaking of, of Paul, advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And you know what that custom and that law was that they were being charged by the apostle Paul with breaking? Emperor worship. I mean, they worship the God of wine, they worship the God of sex, they worship the God of hunting, but one of the things that ran throughout the entire Roman world was emperor worship, where the person who was Caesar, whether it be Caesar Augustus or Caesar Nero, was worshipped as a god. And here comes the Apostle Paul saying, Christ is the only way, Christ is the only God, there is only one true God, and he revealed himself through Jesus Christ and the resurrection, and he would prove who Jesus was through the Old Testament. And here he goes to Philippi with hardly any Jews, and he goes right to the most intelligent and the most wealthy people of the city, and he begins to preach the gospel. And they're saying, wow, what Paul was teaching us is something that we as Romans aren't even allowed to follow because of emperor worship. That's what kind of atmosphere um, was in Philippi. And for the most part, like I said, there were hardly any Jews. And the only Jews that were actually in Philippi were Jewish missionaries. They were legalists, and they were seeking to undo the work of the apostle Paul. And so in this opening passage, right here in Philippians chapter 1, so if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there or pull it up on your phones. Right here in this beginning passage of Scripture, Paul is writing this epistle to the Philippian church, the Philippians. And the first thing that Paul does in dealing with the issues going on at Philippi is he gives thanks and he prays. You know, I'm not perfect at confrontation or conflict management, and something that I have to constantly remind myself is that as I go about overcoming things or dealing with things, one of the most important things that you can do as a Christian, as a person, is to pray about your issue and give thanks for something. Find a way to find the good in someone or in something or in a circumstance, and here's why. is because when we pray and we give thanks, it brings proper perspective to what we're dealing with. As I said, maybe your mountain this year is overcoming your weight or your food addiction. Maybe it's dealing with somebody in a relationship. Maybe it's finances. Whenever you approach an issue, we should pray about it and find a way to give thanks because that's us training. That's us giving ourselves the right mindset with the right attitude, with the right kind of action. In other words, when Paul writes this opening part of the letter, He's going to say, this is how you overcome the mountain that you're getting ready to face. Now, for the church of Philippi, it was disunity. That was their issue. They were struggling with disunity, and Paul says, look, I want you to have joy, I want you to give thanks, and I want you to be unified together. So let's read along this passage together this morning. It says here in verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the deacons, these were leaders of the church, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. 
because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers of me with grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Remember, Paul was thrown in prison, dragged before the magistrates. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. That's a big statement. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and, be, and, so be sure, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about this morning is we are looking at this section, this first section of Scripture, where really Paul is going to deal with his concerns for the church at Philippi. But right here, Paul is going to pray, and he's going to give thanks. Let's take a look at Paul's thanksgiving. You know what I find interesting is that in this section of Scripture, as Paul deals with the problems at the church of Philippi, the first thing that he's able to do is he is able to give thanks as he expresses his concern. I mean, you want to talk about conflict management 101. Paul is able to find the silver lining despite the problems that are going on at at this church. Now think about that for yourself. You are not all bad, despite being maybe overweight with a food addiction. You're not all bad. There are good things about you. You do good things. There are praiseworthy things about you. You're not worthless. You're not unimportant. You still have value. There are so, there are so many things that are actually good about you, despite maybe this obstacle that you're trying to overcome. Or maybe you don't have a lot of money. Maybe you're struggling to find a job. Maybe you hate the place that you work. There are still praiseworthy things about you. Maybe your relationships are a mess. Maybe you're having problems with people, family, or friends. That doesn't mean, all in all, you're a terrible person. It doesn't mean that every aspect of you is bad. It means that you have a mountain that you have to climb. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, Paul still finds a way to bring the joy and the good out of a situation, out of a church, out of a group of people. And I suggest this year that we do that exact same thing. That we, as we go about our challenges and our issues, let us take a moment to pause and give thanks. Because giving thanks provides perspective to our problems and to our issues. Here's the first thing Paul says in verse 3. I thank my God in all remembrance of you. You know, the English writers pulled this proverb from the Germans, and many of us know what this is, and we use it all the time. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. It's kind of a very powerful visual statement, isn't it? And as you can imagine, in ancient times, they really didn't have a lot of ways and easy ways to get a lot of water in the house, and so they were able to fill up a basket or a tub that you could fit a baby in. That's about as much water as they could carry, and that's what they would bathe their child in. And of course, what would happen to the water once you bathed your child? It would get dirty. And they would take it back down to the river, and they would throw the dirty water out. And the proverb that they came up with, up with was this, don't throw out the good by trying to get rid of the bad. Yes, Philippi, Philippians, yes, church, you've got some problems. You've got some issues you need to work on. But don't get rid of the good by trying to get rid of the bad. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And look, we all go to churches that have problems. If this is your first time here, welcome to a group of imperfect people. Welcome to a church that has problems. Welcome to a preacher who's got issues and has sin problems. We all do. We all mess up. We all make mistakes. We all fall short. But that doesn't mean that everything's bad. We all have challenges that we need to work through. All churches have flaws. All people have flaws. Eventually, if you look hard enough, you're going to find a church that has something that you disagree with. That's a part of life. In fact, I would argue that there is zero aspect of life that we will always go through something that we always agree with. It just simply isn't going to happen. And the answer isn't to give up or to leave or to throw in the towel. The answer is to heal with the perspective of thanksgiving. He says in verse 4, I not only thank God for you, but always in every prayer of mine for you, making my prayer with joy. That's what's so powerful about Paul. He was able to take every thought about the church at Philippi and he was able to turn it into joy. Even when he was reminded of their problems, 
even when he was reminded of their deficiencies. You see, the church at Philippi certainly shared in hard times with Paul. I mean, think about it. Their church and their movement was born in a city of complete, utter corruption, of sexual sin, of money laundering, of deception, of evil. I mean, the, Rome, yes, they had peace because of their military control, but Rome was a very corrupt and very dirty and evil generation and group of people. The empire of Rome was by no means something that we would consider acceptable today. We would look at them and say, wow, they are very barbaric. But yet, through this obstacle, through this challenge, they were able to have a deeper relationship with Paul and a deeper relationship with Christ. It was through overcoming and climbing their mountain that they were able to develop their character and their love for each other. Now, let's ask this question, why does Paul have joy? I mean, Paul's been thrown in prison. Paul's been persecuted. Paul's been shipwrecked. He was on a ship and he was sailing to Rome and he got shipwrecked and his clothes were stripped from him. I mean, he's cold and he's naked. I mean, Paul's basically been through anything that you could possibly imagine that would stink. He's been through it. And yet through his prayer time, when he thinks about the church at Philippi, he's able to have joy. And why? It says it here in verse 5. He says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Ten years ago, Paul first visited Philippi. He's writing the letter to the Philippians 10 years later, and he says, I still have joy because you're still in it with me. How long have you been in the church? How long have you been going steady at a commitment with a group of people? How long have you challenged yourself? If it's one day, good. If it's 10 days, great. If it's 10 months, even better. 10 years they labored with Paul despite their challenges, despite their religious diversity that they confronted every day. Ten years they were committed. And he says, look, you're not just my partner. The, the word for partner here is the word fellowship. Here's what a fellowship means. It means to contribute to something of yourself, to the lives of others. When we gather in church on Sunday as a, as a group of people, as a movement, and we fellowship among the saints, that's a term that's used throughout the Bible. If you're not contributing to the lives of those around you, you're not fellowshipping. If you're not doing something, you're not partnering. You're not fellowshipping. That's what Paul means here. If we're not serving, if we're not giving, if we're not doing, we're not really partnering with the church. And Paul says, look, I have joy because you are fellowshipping with me. You are partnered with me. We're in this thing together. And let me tell you something, guys. Life is better when we do things together. We can't do life alone. You can't hold yourself accountable. We are created to be with other people, with other things with those around us. If you think you're going to be able to climb this mountain alone, you're not. We need each other, just like Paul needed the church at Philippi. And for Paul, this relationship went deeper than just friendship. They were partners in kingdom work. If you want to develop friends, do kingdom work together. If you want to help overcome your challenge, your obstacle, make it kingdom work with people around you. And the churches in Macedonia, they partnered together, they cared for the poor, they shared in the gospel, they gave, they sacrificed. This church was on fire for Jesus, even in the midst of complete opposition. Paul talked about the church at Philippi in Romans 15. He talked about the church at Philippi in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He literally said, give and live like these people do. That's what kind of people that we're talking about here. Now, the church at Philippi with other churches, they were contributing to the gospel in a real tangible way. It was through their financial support. And you know what the truth is? Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And the church at Philippi, they were not afraid to give. Paul was not only joyful and thankful for their fellowship, but look what he says in verse 6. He says, and I am sure of this. I've got confidence in you. He says that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion to the day of Christ. Look, Paul was confident that God was at work. He was confident of it. If God starts something, God is going to complete something. And look, guys, God is not finished with you. There are no amount of mistakes, other than turning your back on God and simply walking out and giving up, there are no amount of mistakes that can cause God to give up on you. God is still at work, and even when people in your life or at your job or in your family or whatever it is, even with yourself, you giving up on yourself, God has not given up on you. He is still at work. He can help you climb that mountain and overcome your obstacles. God will complete the work 
and the people at the church at Philippi, and God will complete his work in you. Now, what work did God begin in them? I think the immediate context is what Paul was talking about here, giving. That God, for whatever means, has given the, the church at Philippi a gracious and a giving heart, whatever circumstances he produced them in, God caused the church at Philippi to be a church of givers. But I think it's much deeper than that. Because our giving reflects our heart. And really what I think Paul was getting at is, look, your giving is a reflection of what kind of people that you are. But God is at work deep within your spirit, deep within your soul, because your giving reflects God's work on your spirit and on your heart. And God isn't done yet. And that says a couple of things. First of all, it says this, we have room to grow. We have room for improvement. If you think that you've reached the mountaintop, you've got another mountain to climb. You've got room to grow no matter what part of life that you're in that we've talked about this morning. The second thing it means is this, God is at work. God is present. You see, God provided not just the means for them to share their money, but the means for them to change their lives. God is not just interested in your service, your money, you sharing the gospel. Those are all reflections of what God is really concerned about, and that's your heart and your spirit, and your life, and who you are as a person, who I am as a person. God's work goes deeper than our pocketbook. It goes deeper than our friendships and our marriages and our relationships. It goes deeper than our professional career. God's work goes to the very core of who we are as a person. And guess what? God is not too far away from us. That's what Paul was saying. God doesn't just come and intervene. And he's like, all right, see you later next year when you got another problem you want to overcome. God is present every day with us. He's with us all the time. Now, Paul saw this generosity in the Philippians as evidence that God was at work in their lives. And for a moment this morning, I'd like for you to pause. And I'd like for you to think about, what is the evidence that God is at work in me? What am I doing? If I'm fellowshipping, if I'm partnering with the church, what is the evidence of my partnership? What is my contribution? How am I giving? How am I doing? How am I living? How am I sharing? What time am I spending with people? What is the evidence that God is at work in me? And the good news is, is that God is not too far away if he's not at work at you. And God hasn't given up on you if he is at work in you. God is near. God is here. Paul goes on to say in verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you all. He says, look, I'm confident. I'm in my right to feel this way. I'm not flattering you. I'm telling you what the truth is because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers of me with grace. We're in it together, baby. That's what he's saying. We're in this together, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Yes, Paul was thrown in prison. Yes, Paul stood before philosophers and rulers and governors, and he defended the gospel. He gave an apologia, an apologetic. He defended the truth of Christianity. And Paul says, look, church at Philippi, I am so thankful for you. For the last 10 years, you've been my partner in this. And he says in verse 8, for God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. The ancients believed that the operation of their emotions came from their bowels, from their stomach. And sometimes we feel that way. You ever been sick to your stomach about something before? Yeah, it's your emotions, you know, it changes the, the makeup of your biology. Like when I'm climbing up high or in a mall and my emotions take over and I start to feel weak, that's, they believe the center of their emotions was right here. And Paul says, look, with everything that Christ is, I love you and I care for you. And that says a lot about how to overcome our obstacles, our challenges, how to climb our mountain, is that we can't forget that, yes, everybody may leave us. We may be completely and totally alone, but God loves us. He has affection for us. You can't go too far away from God. He'll chase you down with his love. And then Paul offers up this prayer. He says in verse 9, and it is my prayer. Here's, here's what Paul wanted them to do. And here's what I want to do. And here's what I hope you want to do. He says, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. Now, the first thing that he mentions right here is love. It's the word agape. 
That's the Greek word for love. They had different words for love. It means self-sacrificial love. It means selfless action to the benefit of someone else. It's this model of love that we have in Christ Jesus who gave himself up for others, seeking the good for those around him. And he says, look, I want you to abound in love. To abound in love means to be present in abundance. It means to have a lot. Keep on abounding. And then he adds this emphasis. He says, more and more in love. I want you to abound more and more. It's like building layer upon layer, one after the other. Despite this great expression of love, Paul says, look, you've got room to love each other more. You know, you can't love other people if you don't love yourself. What's the greatest commandment? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Self-love is unique. It's important. It's not selfish. It's not egocentric. It's self-sacrificial, but it's you care for yourself. You can see the value that God has placed upon you and that God has given you. It's impossible to really love other people if you can't love yourself, if you can't let God love you. And so you need to see value in yourself, not in a self-centered, 21 first century, egotistical way, but in a biblical way. You need to abound in love more and more for yourself, but also more and more for others. Give more. Serve more, study with others more, share the gospel more, sacrifice more, climb the mountain of love more and more. That's the nature of the love. And look at the environment. He says, he gives these these clarifications. Love with discernment and knowledge. Knowledge is the first environment in which biblical love really truly goes. It, It literally means this. I want you to have the practical ability to apply your knowledge and your love. See, we can all love in different ways. That doesn't make it right. We can all have self-sacrificial love for one another, but if it doesn't have knowledge attached to it, if it doesn't have information attached to it, it can be completely and utterly wrong. C.S. Lewis gave this example. He said, consider a, a mother who loves her child with unconditional, unabounding love. Abounding love. If there aren't parameters on that, soon that love for her child will actually become wrong. The love for her child will cause her to overlook his misgivings and his failures. It will cause her to treat others in ways that they shouldn't be treated because she has absolute unfailing love for her child. It will cause her to discriminate against the people around her. Why? Against her husband. Why? Because she loves her child without any knowledge, without any discernment. And so love isn't just love. There is an age to love. There is a number to love. There are parameters and restrictions and guidelines to this thing that we called self-sacrificial love. Love is to be defined in the context, Paul says, of knowledge and discernment. Here's what he wanted them to do. He wanted them to have depth and insight. That's what discernment means. It means the ability to make moral decisions, to have moral discretion. It's the ability to discern evil from good. And so you got a lot of people out here in this world that just wants to put love as love and a label on everything, when that's just simply not true. Love has discernment. Love has knowledge. And those things should be applied, according to Paul. Think about the church at Philippi. They are in a city of religious diversity with human sacrifice, orgies, animal worship, all kinds of things that we would never think about crossing the boundaries of today. And Paul says, look, you got to have guidelines to this thing called love you got to have guidelines to this thing called self-sacrifice, passion. It's knowledge. It's discernment. True acts of love, according to Paul, are made within the confines of knowledge and discernment. And what's the result? What happens? Look what he goes on to say. He says, I want you to abound in love more and more with all knowledge and discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. To approve what is excellent means to test by trial. They actually would use this word to pick something up and stare at it in the gaze of the sun so that they could see whether or not it had any uh, deformities or discrepancies. They would do this with coins and materials that, that they would make. They would hold it up to the sun and they would look and they would judge. And Paul says, look, when you love more and more, with knowledge and discernment, you're going to be able to see things as they truly are. You're going to be able to approve what is good and what is bad, what is true, what is false. And look, there are some things that are really harmful to us that we need to avoid. In the movement of accomplishing our goal and climbing our mountain, we can't embrace things that are harmful. But at the same time, we have to embrace things that are good. 
We have to add on habits and characteristics that are beneficial and godly. And so Paul says, look, here's my prayer for you. Not only am I thankful for you despite the challenges that you face, here's my prayer that you would grow, that you would grow this year in love and that it would abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that you can improve what is excellent. And so Paul says, I want you to have a growing love with moral knowledge and moral insight. But look at it also, his other prayer. He not only wanted them to grow in love, but also character. And this is what we'll end with. He says in verse 10, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ and filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and to the praise of God. He says, look, I want you to grow in love and I want you to grow in character. He, the kind of character that he wants us to have, the first thing he uses is pure to inspect it, to judge it. The second word that he uses is blameless, to have a blameless life, to be free from blame. He says, look, this is the result of your life. I want you to be pure, and I want you to be blameless. That's the kind of character that I want you to have. Now, how in the world would they accomplish this? Well, his, 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 this is how. He, look what he says. He says, filled with the fruit of righteousness. Be pure, be blameless by being filled with the fruit of righteousness. This is ethical righteousness. Here's simply what it means. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Abound in love more and more with knowledge and discernment so that you can approve what is excellent. And when it comes to your character, I want you to be blameless. I want you to be pure by simply being filled with the fruit of righteousness. Here's simply what that means. Doing the right thing by God for the people around you and in sharing the gospel. That's what Paul wanted for the church at Philippi. That's what I want for me this year. I hope that's what you want for for you this year. And here's the reason. Here's the purpose. This is why we do what we do. This is why we gather together and we fellowship. Paul says, here's why I want you to do this. To the glory and the praise of God. Here's our motivation. This is why I want to lose weight. Is because I want God to be glorified. I don't want to be a glutton. Here's why I want to get better at my relationships around me is because I want God to be glorified. Here's why I want to do a better job. Here's why I want to make more money. Here's why I want to save and invest and give is because I want God to be glorified and praised. This is our motivation. This is why we do the things that we do. We grow to the glory of God. And if we give and if we change and if we serve and sacrifice And God doesn't get the glory. We've missed the big picture on our growth. You know, Edmund Hillary, he was one of the first to climb Mount Everest. Um, And the first time he tried to climb Mount Everest in 1952, he failed. He did go on to climb Mount Everest again, first to ever do it. Um, Pretty impressive feat, if you ask me. But after he failed his first attempt, a few weeks later, he was speaking to a group in England. And he walked to the edge of the stage and he made a fist. And he pointed at the picture of a mountain that was off to the side. And here's what he said. Mount Everest, you beat me the first time, but I'll beat you the next time. Because you've grown all you're going to grow. But I will come again and I will conquer you. Because as a mountain, you can't grow. But as a human, I can. And we all have our mountains to climb. And our situations may not change, but we can We can change to the glory of God. Let's stand and let's pray.